life. So great to see y'all. So great to be back. Oh my goodness. It's been four years since I have been here. And uh, honestly, this entire week has been filled with emotions. Um, my family and I, we lived here for a little over 10 years in central Arkansas. I was on staff here for about the exact same time and uh, have so many incredible memories here. Um, my son was born here in Conway, dedicated here at this church. I baptized my daughter right over here. She's a freshman in high school now. Um, it, it's, it's blowing my mind. And um, I just want to say, before I even get started, I uh, want to honor Pastor Rick and Michelle um, for their investment into our lives and, and so many out here. I know you've, you've been impacted by their obedience to the call of God. And of course, I don't believe that I'd be where I'm at or our church would even exist if it weren't for their obedience. And Hunter and Katie, thank you, Hunter, for those kind words. I'll pay you later, hook you up, thank you. Um, but I've just been, I was even talking to Hunter earlier this week, just all the great things I'm hearing God's doing at this campus, some unique things that are taking place in this season. And uh, can we just put our hands together for Jesus, for your leadership, for what God's doing? So about four years ago, we moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and we planted a church uh, just north of the city in a, in a town called Cranberry Township. And uh, we planted our church uh, eight weeks before COVID, January 19th, 2020. So it has been a wild three years. We just celebrated three years as a church back in January. Let me show you a picture of my family. My wife and my daughter, they wish they could be here, but they are not with me. Uh, that's my wife, Lauren, in the green, my daughter, Emma, and my son, Jaden, he is with me. My wingman is on the front row. I will tell you, I asked my son right before I came out here, I said, buddy, will you please just pray for me? Pray for dad. I'm about to go preach. And, and he was real quiet. He goes, okay, dad, let me just think for a second. I want to know how to pray. And he prayed over me. He said, God, I just pray that he'd do a great job today. He said, and Lord, please let him not tell any dad jokes from the stage. In Jesus' name, amen. I was like, and that's how you know I'm over 40. And my son just proved it. So... Uh, I was thinking about this, of course, having been on staff for so long, I want to tell you a story about your campus pastor real quick. So I loved having fun when we were on staff, messing with other people. And Hunter, when he first came on staff, I did this to him. Messed with his office one day, thought I got him really good, pranked him. And then a couple weeks later, somebody put something in my office that smelled terrible. And I can't go into the full, the story, all the context, but it was so bad. I took every piece of furniture out of the office. I removed ceiling tiles and I was on my hands and knees. I mean, face to the floor, carpet fibers, trying to figure out what this smell was. And I figured somebody put something in there. Well, I did eventually find it. I'm not gonna tell you what it was, but it was awful. And for years I've blamed Hunter and no one fessed up to it. I mean, it's been like seven years ago this happened. And I'm like, it was Hunter, it was Hunter. Y'all don't have to tell me, I know it was Hunter. Well, about six months ago, somebody called me. They said, I just wanna let you know, that thing that happened in your office, like almost a decade ago, it wasn't Hunter. It was Luke Brown, another guy that I worked with. <laughs> So finally, I was like, I released Hunter, I forgave him. And I never liked Luke, I just want you to all know, I, I never liked him as a friend. Here's something that's interesting. Over the last few years, everybody in this room, you can relate. It's been a difficult, challenging few years on a variety of different levels. Our world just feels like it's totally changed since 2020. And after we planted our church, we go through the first year or two, if I would ever tell our story, especially to others that were in ministry or people that, that knew us, they're like, man, I feel so bad. It's what a, what a terrible time to try to plant a church or start something brand new. Of all the times throughout history, you could have started something. It had to have been around COVID. And at times, you know, I would hear that. And of course, all of us know it's been a difficult few years, but as I've reflected back, when we celebrated three years as a church, I'm gonna tell you, my perspective has changed. I'm actually extremely thankful that God chose us to go when we did to do what he called us to do the way we did it, simply because the older I get, the re I realize something, that the times in our life that are filled with the most pain, the times in our life that are filled with the most difficulty is often the very place that God wants to do his greatest work. Those are the seasons of our lives where God becomes more real. We see his faithfulness in a whole new way. And so what I wanna talk about for a few minutes here this morning is how do we walk that life out with Jesus? 
How do we live, as scripture would say, a life that's, that's worthy as we're following Christ? Because if you've been around church any length of time, you've heard that phrase. I mean, how's your walk with God going? How's your walk with Jesus? And, and sometimes you can hear things like that. Maybe you've responded in that way. I don't know, when I hear it, sometimes I think to myself, how do I know I'm even walking in the right direction? How do I even know that, that my walk is headed, where I'm headed, where I'm going, where my destination, am I really, am I, am I lost? Am I wandering? Where am I at in this journey? I think scripture gives us a clear path. Let's take a look. Colossians chapter one, verses nine through 14. We're gonna dig into these five verses. It says this, this is Paul writing this. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Please don't forget that. Bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you would have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who's qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Will you pray with me one more time here this morning? Lord, we thank you for this time that we get to gather here in church Jesus, we came for you. It's all about you. Help us to leave with a greater sense of who you are and what you wanna do through our lives. In your name we pray, amen. Just to give you a little context on the book, book of Colossians, if you haven't read it in a while, I highly encourage you to do it. It's four chapters long, but it's powerful. All about Jesus. And the first few verses before we get to verse nine, the one that I just read, it's actually Paul encouraging the Christians in this place called Colossae, where this church was planted. Paul is writing to a group of people that he never met, and he's writing to a church that he didn't plant. But what's amazing is his friend Epaphras actually planted that church after getting saved in one of Paul's journeys to Ephesus. So Paul's preaching to the crowd, this man gets saved, ends up going and planting three churches, and the church at Colossae was one of them. In the first few verses of chapter one, Paul is hearing reports from his friend how the believers are doing in this city, and it's all encouraging. Paul says, man, I'm so excited about your love for Jesus, your love for one another. You're holding on to this eternal hope that one day you're gonna be in heaven. But along the way, Paul notices some things that also need to be corrected, some things that need to be encouraged. Because at this time, the church of Colossae was dealing something that we in our culture deal with here today as well. It was something called syncretism, which means there were all these different, different pluralities of religion competing for space in individuals' hearts. Meaning, the people that were following Jesus, they were hearing all this false teaching. They were hearing culture basically say, hey, you need more than Jesus. You need, yeah, it's great that you're following Christ, but you need some other things added into your faith as well. As an example, here's how it practically could look today. Uh, in our culture. Be like, hey, Monday, I'm gonna read my horoscope. Tuesday, I'm gonna mess with the healing crystals. Wednesday, I'm gonna cleanse my aura. And then Thursday, little Buddha. Friday, I'm gonna have the cards read. Saturday, I'm gonna get my palms read. And then Sunday, I'm gonna sprinkle in a little bit of Jesus. Paul's very concerned. He's like, you know what? I need everybody to know if you're following Jesus, if Jesus is everything you've got, then he is everything that you need. In fact, here's a better way to say it. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And my heart, my goal, and, and what I hope you walk away with here this morning is that you would gain a greater revelation of who Jesus is and what he desires to do in your life. All right, so crowd participation time. If you've ever been impacted by the grace of God or that you sense God has been active in your life at some point, raise your hand. Okay, everybody here at church. Let me just tell you, if you sense that God has moved on your behalf, on your family's behalf in some way, I can promise you that somewhere at some time, someone was praying for you. Someone was praying, believing, taking you. They took your life personally, your situation personally. And said, so I'm gonna take you before the God of creation and believe that he would move on your behalf in a mighty way. 
Paul so loved these people that he had never met. He's praying something very powerful. And he even says it in the, in the very first part of this chapter, we've not stopped praying for you. Paul's saying, hey, I need you to know that we've got your back. We're gonna be praying for you. We're, we're believing God's best for you. And here's what he prays. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the spirit gives. Paul is praying, and, and this applies to our life as well, that these believers in Colossae would get a greater picture and revelation of who Jesus is. Because here's the reality. When you find out how big Jesus is and how much he really wants to be a part of your life, it's gonna radically trans transform your perspective. It's gonna change you when you see how big Jesus actually wants to be in your life. It's the difference between head knowledge and heart knowledge. And I think at times, I mean, maybe you can relate to this. If you've been around church for any length of time, and maybe you even know some scripture, and, and you have halfway decent church attendance, and you think, man, I'm doing pretty good. To be honest, that can be an extremely dangerous place to live your life spiritually. And let me tell you why. Because you've learned, like many of us, how we can just fake it. Coming to church check the box, get the coffee, do the worship, maybe even serve every once in a while, all good things, by the way. But at times, if that replaces your walk with Jesus, you'll find yourself hearing the gospel, hearing the truth, and yet your heart hasn't changed at all. Why is that? Well, because the goal isn't intellectual information that we're after, it's actually heart and soul transformation. So here's why Paul is praying that prayer. He says, so that you would live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who's qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. That word where Paul's praying that you would live a, a life that's worthy, the Greek word is peripateo. It means how somebody literally walks spiritually. The whole point why Paul is praying this is if you say that you are a Christian, if you say that you are following Jesus, then we should walk differently when we encounter Jesus. We should live and respond differently when we follow Christ. About three weeks ago, we were getting ready to do a, a prayer meeting for the church. And I thought, I didn't have a whole lot of time. I'm like, I'm gonna run to the gym real quick, get a quick workout, and then I'm gonna go pray. And so we get done with the class. The coach says, hey, a great class, everybody. Just wanna let you know whoever has the Honda parked out in the front, somebody hit your car in the middle of class. And I'm like, it's not the, the gray Honda, is it? And they're like, well, it's that car out there. And of course, it, it was my vehicle. And somebody had parked in the parking lot, wasn't paying attention, cut the corner when they were pulling out of the space too hard, not just hit my car, tore the whole front end of my car off, gone. And uh, thank God the, the man had integrity, stuck around, and uh, he walked up to me. Now, keep in mind, I'm, I'm getting ready to go, I'm getting ready to go pray, getting ready to do a prayer meeting. And I see this, I'm looking at my car, just bought it last year, looking at the car, looking at him, he comes up, he's like, man, I'm so sorry, I didn't see your car. I just, you know, I, I, this is what I did. And the whole time, what I am thinking in my head is I'm a pastor in this community. I'm a pastor in this community. <laughs> he, he's, he may have visited my church before. I wish I wasn't a pastor right now. And so, you know, exchange insurance, it's, it's all good. And at the whole time, I'm like, man, I, I, need to, I need to invite this dude to church. I need to invite him to Easter. I wanted to invite him to our Easter service. But I'm struggling because what I wanted to say, what I wanted to respond with, I, I held it back. And I need you to know that I invited that brother to Easter services on Sunday. I passed the test, um, but I did it after the insurance claim went through. I just wanted to make sure that that, <laughs> first things first. Here's what this reminds me of, how we walk. Reminds me of a story, you could look at it later in Genesis chapter 32 and verse 22. This is where Jacob is wrestling the angel. He's wrestling with God. And the story goes that Jacob will not let go until the Lord blesses his life. 
And in the midst of this struggle that's taking place, eventually, when Jacob walks away from that encounter with God, the Bible said his hip was put out of place. And I don't know if he walked with a, with a limp or a gimp, but he walked differently, the Bible says, from that encounter with the Lord. It actually goes back to the, the original Genesis account in creation that we were made in God's image, in his likeness. You and I, if we're following Jesus, we are meant, our lives are meant to look more like him. We're meant to walk like him. And so when Paul prays that, hey, I want you guys to have this greater knowledge of God's will for your life, here's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that uh, this particular scenario was, man, uh, I'm gonna pray for who I'm supposed to marry or, or that next step in my life that God wants me to take this job or take that job. I do believe the Lord will lead us and guide us if we ask him on those topics. But what Paul was actually praying for in this scenario was, are there any areas in your walk with God that you know to be inconsistent with what the word of God, what the Lord's will is for your life? Here's a better way to say it. Do you know right now, are there any areas of your life where I'm consistently inconsistent? Because these are the areas that God desires to transform. It's like, I've done this before in my life. I've compartmentalized areas of my, of my life. Jesus, you can have access here, but not over there. Stay away from that. But, oh, hey, you could have some time with me over here. Paul's saying, you need to give Christ access to everything in your life. So coming back to how we walk, how do we know if we're walking in the right direction, if we're serving and we're following Jesus? How do we know if we're living this worthy life? Paul talked about the attributes, and this is a life that pleases God. This is how you know you're on the right path. The first is this, your life is producing fruit. Scripture says, bearing fruit in every good work. It means you're growing in your relationship as a follower of Jesus. Your character is changing. Your life is changing. My grandmother in Northeast Ohio, she just turned 97 years old, Grandma Zorn. Grandma has a huge crab apple tree in her backyard. And for years when I was growing up, it would not be uncommon for me to go outside. My grandfather would be on a ladder and he would be swatting the apples with a broomstick. He would see me, I was younger, I was probably my son's age. He'd be like, Lauren, get up on the ladder, hit some apples. So I'm swatting apples down and they're gathering them up and applesauce, apple butter. My, my grandmother's canning things for years. And so we, we've got all these apples everywhere. Well, fast forward a few years later, I'm in high school and I went out in the backyard and I realized something. Fruit tree really wasn't producing fruit the way it used to. It's like, that's strange. There's not as, many, not as many apples on the branches, not as many apples on the ground. And then after I had graduated, I remember going back one year and I remember going out in the backyard and the tree had completely stopped producing fruit. I was like, that is bizarre. It's abnormal for a fruit tree to not produce fruit. Well, let me just tell you, it's abnormal for a Christian to not have character traits that represent Christ. It's abnormal for us to not have something in our life that defines the faith that we profess. In the New Testament, the Bible talks about, hey, we're not saved by our good works, by good deeds, but we are saved for good works. It means that our behaviors should change as Jesus is changing us. So your life produces fruit. Number two, you're growing in the knowledge of God. This refers more to like a deepening commitment in your relationship with Jesus. This scripture is not on the screen, but I'm gonna read it anyways. Hosea 6, 6, this is the Lord. He says, I want you to show love, not offer sacrifices. I want you to know me more than I want burnt offerings. It means that God's always been about your heart. He wants more of you. And the longer you walk with Jesus, the deeper that relationship grows and the closer you become to Christ. So my wife and I, in May, we're gonna be celebrating 20 years of marriage, which is awesome. And uh, when I think back about the beginning of our marriage to where we're at now, it's very clear to me that I love my wife so much more now than I did when we first got married. I loved her back then. But you know how bizarre it would be if you saw me around the time that we were celebrating 20 years, and if you're like, Foster, congratulations, man, 20 years. And if I just responded like, eh, it's not that big of a deal. 
oh, 20 years, yeah, I mean, I guess it's, a, you know, something to celebrate, but, you know, my love for my wife really hasn't grown a whole lot. I mean, you know, maybe just a little bit, but 20, it's, it's not much different than year one. Well, first of all, my wife would kill me, okay? That would never happen. But I want you to consider how sad that kind of relationship would be. Because if I describe that kind of relationship with my spouse, it would be very apparent that that love, that relationship stopped growing a long time ago. And when Paul's praying this for these particular people, it's like he's saying, I don't wanna just hear about the good things that God is doing in someone else's life, although I can celebrate that. I mean, I wanna experience some of these good truths in my own life as well. I wanna experience what Jesus could do and how he could transform my life because when I start to see how good God is and how much he's done in my life, my relationship, my love, my knowledge of who he is continues to grow. I want you to think about relationships or marriages in your sphere of influence that you respect or admire. You would say, man, I love being around this particular couple because I know they love each other, they love Jesus, they're an inspiration. But on the flip side, maybe we've seen it or maybe we're living in a relationship now where that love has grown distant, that love has grown cold. It's, it's almost like you can tell when a relationship has grown apart because, hey, we're together, but we stopped growing a long time ago. And the encouragement is, Keep growing in your walk with Jesus. Keep pursuing your relationship with Christ. Number three, you're being strengthened with all power. This is what Paul says. According to his glorious might, that so you will have endurance and patience. And why are you gonna need strength? Why are you gonna need something supernatural to, to, to give you endurance and patience in your life? Because life is hard, but God is good. Amen because you're gonna have many opportunities if you haven't already to walk away from God, to walk away from church, to walk away from your marriage, to walk away from relationships, to walk away from friendships. You're gonna have many opportunities to stay hurt, to stay wounded, to stay bitter, to bear unforgiveness. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? Come on. Here's what Paul's praying. I'm praying that you would have this supernatural God-given strength that when those temptations hit your life, you have the endurance and the patience to overcome. Here's how it looks practically for you and me. When you're hurt, you start to move towards healing. When you've been wounded, you start to move towards forgiveness because you remember how much Jesus has forgiven you. So he's gonna give you the capacity and the strength that you're going to need to forgive somebody else. Instead of walking away from God, instead of walking away from the Lord, you're gonna cling to him. Instead of walking away from relationships, instead of walking away from friendships, instead of walking away from your marriage when it gets difficult, you're gonna dig in. You're gonna figure out how can I grow in my depth in this relationship? Because God's gonna give me strength and endurance and patience no matter what it is that I might face. Instead of walking away from church, you're gonna stay engaged in church, realizing that there is no perfect church, there are no perfect people. The reason that we don't have perfect churches is because we are all imperfect people, but we're serving and pursuing a perfect savior. Remember, Paul's talking about how to live a worthy life, how to walk this relationship with Jesus out. So if we are here and Jesus is the destination, then the path that we are walking on is obedience. Here's a better way to say it. Jesus is the destination. Obedience is the path. And by the way, this path that I'm talking about, this is not always easy to follow. If you've served God at any point in your life, it is not linear, it's not a straight line, it's gonna be difficult, it's gonna be challenging, the terrain is gonna get rocky. Oftentimes when you're following Jesus, you're gonna be confused why you're headed in that direction. It's like, God, do you see where I'm going? Do you see where I'm headed? Do you see what you've brought me through? I feel like I could find a shortcut. I feel like, God, there's a better way. 
Or maybe you've even found yourself off the path completely. You're lost. You're wandering trying to find your way back. What Paul is saying is this. As you're walking in obedience towards Jesus, the Lord's going to give you supernatural strength coupled with endurance and patience that no matter what you face, no matter what you go through, he is with you. He will never lead you. He, he will never leave you. He will guide you. He is gonna be with you the entire way. Even when it gets confusing, even when you start to wonder, Lord, where are you taking me? I'd rather go somewhere else. There's a guy in our city, his name's Matt, and one of the most humble dudes I've ever met in a small group with him and a handful of other pastors. And he heads up a prayer organization and he's from Montana. So last year he said, hey, got a group of us together. Would you guys like to go pray in Montana for a couple of days? I said, yes, I would love to. And so it was a great time. One of the last days we were there, we go to this national park, huge hiking trail. But if you walked along this trail, there's signs everywhere. Don't go off the path, stay here, danger. And of course, after a while, to be quite honest, the path was getting boring. And so there's a handful of guys. You get 12 guys in a group, inevitably something's gonna happen. These other group of guys are like, hey, we're gonna go over here. We're gonna go explore. So they tell Matt, they're like, hey, Matt, I know we're all together. But we're gonna go off the path. We're gonna go explore over there and we'll catch up with you guys later. And if you know Matt, he's so soft-spoken, so humble. And he's from that state. He goes, okay, guys. He goes, no big deal. He goes, you can go and, and go off the path. He goes, I just want to let you know, last week, a, a black bear mauled a hiker in this same area. So if you go over there, he said, just make sure I've got a gun. Take my gun. He goes, or take my bear spray. And uh, we'll pray that you find your way back to the path. <laughs> Every man in that circle. Like, I think it's a, just a better idea if we just stay on the path. I mean, we good? Um, I don't need to see that waterfall. I'll just Google Earth it later. It'll be fine. Um, Jesus' path is better than our path. His way for our life is better than our way. I think here's what happens at times. We get frustrated with our relationship with God because we're out there blazing our own trail. We're going and we're doing whatever it is that we want to do, and then we get frustrated with God, and we say, this whole God thing isn't working. This whole following Jesus thing isn't working. Let me just encourage you. It isn't that God's not working. It's that we're not following. We're off on our own path, doing our own thing. And following Jesus means saying no to our path and saying yes to his. It's like we're out there wandering off and Jesus is saying, danger, you're out here on your own. Stay on the path. And as we're walking towards him, our lives are changing. We're becoming more and more like Jesus. Our character is being formed. Our hearts are being transformed. And you're gonna have this supernatural strength that no matter what you face, you remember that you're not alone and that God's gonna help you overcome. Last point, then we're gonna close. Paul says you're gonna live a life that's marked by thankfulness. I think at times, especially when it comes to our relationship with God, we can get to a place where we, we'll, we'll be quick to cry out and ask God for things, which I think is incredible. We should. The Lord says he bends his ear down to those that would cry out to his name. But when was the last time, if you're honest with yourself, you thanked God for all the things he's already given to you? Because so often in my life, I'm focused on where I'm going, where I'm headed, that I forget behind me, if I would just take a look back every once in a while, it's been amazing what he's brought me through. It's been incredible to see his faithfulness over the years and to celebrate all the good things that God has done. I think we could far more often, instead of saying, Lord, I'm asking you to do dot, dot, dot. We could say, God, I wanna thank you for what you've already done. Because Lord, I, I forget way too easy how faithful you've always been. It's the last story, then we're gonna pray. I shared this seven years ago when it happened here in Conway. I went in for a routine surgery uh, to have my thyroid removed, thought it was gonna be matter of fact. In the middle of the surgery, they found cancer that I didn't know until I woke up. Went through treatments. Uh, doctors said they got it all. 
and uh, by the grace of God, my health was good and everything was great. And, and, and that was something that I've been celebrating since seven years ago. But when we moved to Pittsburgh in 2019, got brand new doctors, they found a spot in my neck that didn't look right. And this whole time I'm thinking to myself, this whole ordeal that I was walking through this season, it's, it's over, it's closed book. And they said, no, we, we, we see something there. It's not really making a whole lot of sense. And so they did a little bit more investigating. We'll come to find out I had a, a, another surgery in December of 2020, it took eight lymph nodes out of my neck. And they found a little spot of cancer that I wasn't aware was there. And uh, by God's grace, man, great doctors led me to the right place. And, and for the past three plus years, my health's been perfect, blood work's been perfect. I've been celebrating this whole time along the way. But here's why I'm telling you this story. Because so many times in the last four years, here's where my mind has gone. I've thought to myself, God, if we hadn't been obedient to do what you were asking us to do, would I have ever experienced the healing physically that I received for the doctors that found what they found when they did? And I'll be honest with you, I'm not trying to draw some big conclusion. I don't know the answer to that question. I'm thankful that they found it. I'm thankful that it's gone. But let me tell you deeply what I believe. The things that you are believing God for in your life right now what you're aiming and trusting that Jesus would do or that you don't even expect or know that he's about to do, it is found on the other side of your obedience. So as you're walking towards Jesus, as your life is focused towards him, you have no idea the freedom that he wants to bring to your life. You have no idea the healing that he wants to bring to your life. You have no idea the good things that God has in store for your marriage, for your relationships, for your kids. But let me just encourage you, if there's one thing that I could just leave you with, keep following Jesus. Stay on his path. Don't wander off on your own. And if you're here this morning and you're just struggling, you're like, I don't know, Foster, how do I know if my life is headed in the right direction? If I really am following the path of Jesus, please be encouraged and be reminded, you can know by the attributes that are being produced in your life. Because as you're following Jesus, your life will produce fruit. Character in you will change. Your heart will start to be transformed your knowledge of God will deepen because as you get to know Jesus more and more, you're gonna love him more and more. You're gonna be thankful for what Christ has done in your life more and more. You're gonna look back and it's not gonna be, hey, 20 years, same old thing. It's gonna be this year was better than last year and the next year is gonna be better than the year before. And then you and I are promised that as we're walking that path of obedience, we're gonna be given supernatural strength to help us endure and have patience for whatever it is that we may face. Because whatever we walk through, you're not alone. And you can't face it with your own power. You can't figure it out. You're gonna need something that only God can give you. And then as you walk it out, your whole life is gonna be marked by thankfulness. You're gonna look back and you say, God, I didn't see where you were taking me. I don't know why I had to go that direction. I don't understand why it's been this hard, but I'm gonna look back and I'm gonna be thankful because you've been faithful every step of the way. Let's keep following Jesus. Let's, in obedience, go where he's leading. And I'm trusting God will continue to transform our lives. And my prayer is that he would reveal that to us in a greater way here today.